Lord, take this away. Stop this. Don't do that. Lord, why do you allow this to happen? Why do you allow that to happen? Let me tell you something. The world out there, the world lives in a state of unforgiveness. Its philosophy is unforgiveness. You have a look when you talk to somebody and they've just bumped their toe or fallen on their face or had something bad happen to them. And how many people say, karma gets you, karma, karma gets you. And what does karma say? Karma says you must pay for your actions. You must pay, pay, pay. How well do we know that one? Pay for your sins. Pay for your transgressions. Pay for this. Pay for that. Karma. It's not about love. It's not about Jesus Christ. It's not even what Jesus Christ teaches us. And then we go down the road and we say, Hmm. Maybe if I live a bit better, I'll get into heaven. I must be a good Christian. Go and ask a Muslim, are you going to go into the kingdom of heaven? Are you going to enter paradise? And what will he say to you? He'll say, it's unknown. Why is it unknown? Jesus Christ says to me, I'm going to enter into eternal life. So why would a Muslim say, it is unknown. Because, my dear friends, the Muslim will answer you and say to you that I must live my life with my good deeds outbalancing my bad deeds. And what are good deeds? I don't even want to go there. Because that is also twisted and caught up in the world and in the fabric of the sin that enfolds us. The same fabric of sin that caused Pilate at the trial of Jesus to say, what is truth? Tell me, what is the truth? And turn around and walk away. What is the truth? By what do we live? By what do we function? What is the truth? How, how can we say that God is love? And yet we see the murders and the rapes and the, the sins and the degradation and the pornography and the drugs and the, the terrible things that go on in this world. But yet God is love. Why doesn't God do something about it? Why doesn't He intervene? My brothers and sisters, one of the greatest nations on earth devised a system to destroy humankind. Now I'm not talking about the Americans or the Russians or the Chinese. I'm talking about the Germans. In the late 1930s and going into the 1940s and right up until Germany lost World War II in 1945, there were concentration camps wherein they herded all people that were undesirable Amongst those undesirables were Jews and Gypsies and homosexuals. Were these death camps like Auschwitz? Was Auschwitz, for instance, was that desired by God? No, it wasn't. Was that designed by a despot sitting at his desk and dreaming up all these horrifically cruel things to do to people? To exterminate them. No, it wasn't. It was brought into existence by the academic minds of professors and learned people. It was in the halls of learning and universities in Germany that Auschwitz was born. And the method to kill these people was devised in a laboratory by brilliant minds of the most advanced, technically advanced civilization on earth, the most technically advanced people on earth. 
that everyone looked after and said we want to be like them. That was before 1939 and World War II started. People were hankering after Germany, after Nazi Germany, because it was flashy, it was new, it was flamboyant, and it had every trapping that the heart desired. It even had the mightiest army on earth. But out of that great civilization, from the minds of professors and teachers and scientists, came death camps, ways to exterminate people, like Auschwitz. We have Dr. Mengele. Joseph Mengele, a famous doctor, German doctor. What was he famous for? For doing experiments on children that left them maimed and deformed and disfigured and eventually burned in ovens, cremated. Joseph Mengele did all these experiments in the name of science. And today we say it's evil. But if you lived in Nazi Germany and you followed the dictates of Nazism, he would not have been evil to you, would he? No. Now why, do we ask, God, can you allow that to happen? What does God say? He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul. And Jesus Christ came and added to that and said, love your neighbor as yourself. So where is the love in these dead camps, in this world that's out there? And these things that are confronting us every day. But we forget. Jesus Christ said, If you follow me, be prepared to give up your life. Because by giving up your life for me, you will gain it. For it uses gaining everything in the world and losing your soul. And what price are you prepared to pay for your soul? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Love your neighbor as yourself. How can you love if that freedom to love is removed from you? It is the same as having a toddler on the ground. And the toddler is playing with his toys and he sees the doors open. So he goes, he gets up and he takes his blanket and he strolls out the door and you get him and you put him into a playpen which is with all intents and purposes it's a restraint to keep toddlers in place and babies for that matter and into this playpen go all the toys and all these playpens are is a frame on the floor with bars on it so the toddler can't get out because you love that toddler and you don't want that toddler to go and help hurt itself. You are denying that toddler or that child freedom. So, if God was to intervene and stop us from doing everything that was bad against our fellow man, if God was to prevent these things from happening through His own intervention, if he was to prevent somebody from putting a gun to your head and pulling the trigger, or from a house burning down, or from some other immoral act from happening, if God was to prevent these things, he would be taking away the freedom. And freedom is what perpetrates love. Because love is a free choice. You decide to love somebody else. It is an unselfish act towards somebody else, where you give of yourself freely. And if you have your freedom taken away from you, how can you decide who you're going to love and who you're not going to love? It is the same, bringing 
a curse on somebody when you take away that freedom. And God is not going to take away that freedom because He's a God of love. So because He cannot take away the freedom, He is going to stay non-inventionalist. He's going to remain one side and give us the freedom to continue with our wars and our unforgiveness and our hate and our deceit and our destruction. Because when He intervenes, it will be the end of time. But how often, because we live on the periphery of God's will, because of our sinful natures, we cannot access the complete abundance of God's will, because our failure to love, our failure to have faith, our weakness as human beings, because sin is what clothes us. The grace of God is what saves us. If Jesus Christ is inside me, but nonetheless, this body, the fabric in which my soul exists, is from a sinful nature. So we cannot gain God's full or the, the full understanding of God's intentions, of His will. So we live on the periphery of God's will and we see things happening but we do not understand what this is all about. It makes no sense to us. And so we bash our heads against God all the time like Peter did. Because when something comes up we do not see the whole picture. We stare into the problem. And we forget that God loves us. We forget about Jesus Christ. We forget about our salvation. And we go on our knees and we pray and we fail to have faith. Because his problems seem too mighty like when Peter walked on the waves. Mankind seems too evil. So it is because human beings live on the periphery of God's will that we cannot see and understand and grasp God's will. Let's have a look at Abraham. When Abraham started off on his journey to go and sacrifice Isaac in obedience to God, he did not know what the plan was. He wasn't privy to the will of God. He acted in faith. And my word, how difficult that must have been. God said to him, take your son and go and sacrifice him. And Abraham took his son and they went together up the mountain. And, and when they got up there, he prepared the altar and he laid his son down. And then God stopped him and intervened with a ram caught in a bush. My word. Can you imagine what Abraham was going through when he was walking up that mountain in faith, knowing of the tremendous burden that was lying ahead of him? And still, he did what he did. Because he trusted God. And how often we are confronted by things that we do not see the ultimate, the end outcome, because we do not understand and we are not privy to the will of God. Like Peter did not understand and he was not privy to the will of God at the time that this all happened. And so Peter tried to rebuke Christ and say, no, you won't do that. Don't be stupid. You see, because of Peter's nature, he was one of these guys who wanted to stop bad things from happening. Or he wanted bad things to happen. You know, he was fluctuating and he was impulsive, as we say. So, he lacked the insight, he lacked the faith, maybe, that the other disciples did. But no, he didn't. What made Peter different? What made him want to get out of a boat? Was it because the other disciples 
just saying, well, this isn't important. What was it with Peter? What is it with us? And so Peter responds to Christ, not understanding God's will. If Abraham had responded in the same way as Peter, there would not have been a nation Israel and the Messiah would not have come from that nation. And so we see Abraham take his Isaac, his son, up the mountain to go and sacrifice him in faith, not knowing what the broader picture was, and doing it with a heavy heart, because God, how can you ask me to do this? How can you ask me now? Look at the problem that lies ahead of me. What am I going to say to my wife? What am I going to say to the boy's mother? Lord, please don't let this happen. And Abraham goes up the hill, praying for that cup. I'm sure he was praying for that cup to pass him by, because he did not want to escape execute his only son and offer him to God as a sacrifice. A human sacrifice? Yo, I don't know about you, but it, it's sort of pretty rough. And so God intervened with a ram and Isaac was saved and so we have Jesus Christ coming a thousand years later, two thousand years later, maybe even more. And Jesus Christ in that same city of Jerusalem became the sacrificial lamb for us. On that mountain, instead of an act of faith coming from us at the time, Jesus Christ went to the cross as God himself, stretched out his arms and allowed himself to be sacrificed as a sacrificial lamb, that we may be restored to our Father. And so we find that because Jesus Christ did that first, we don't need to act in the same way that Abraham did to prove our faith to God. We just need to act accordingly towards Jesus Christ and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And what is accordingly? Let His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when you are confronted with a problem, when you are confronted by something from this world that is a hurdle in your way, a hindrance, don't try and judge God. By saying, God, why did you allow this to happen? Or, it is karma. Or, I most probably did something wrong, so I must be punished. God does not require payment from you on this earth for what you have done against Him, because He does everything in love. God does not want you to outbalance your good deeds by your evil, or your evil deeds, by your good deeds, because Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary so that you can be forgiven. He says, give your life up for me, and you will gain it. Don't look after the things of the earth, but look after me, and you will have life everlasting. My brothers and sisters, by doing what Peter did, by saying what he said, he was doing Satan's will. And we must be so careful that we, when we pronounce things, that we are not doing Satan's will. We do not pronounce things, and that is why we do not judge. We do not criticize. We do not gossip. We do not do these things that Scripture says that we must not do. Because we do not know what it is about God's will that we are confronted with. And so we pray.
and we progress. And eventually the will and the intention of God becomes known. In closing, I lived in the beautiful city of Mossel Bay. I was down at the sea every day of my life. I drove along the Golden Route. I was in the Otaniqua Mountains. I could... I loved that life. I went around and I took photographs and I worked as a... as a reporter, as a... as a photographic reporter. And... I saw so many things and I experienced so many things. There was no ways I wanted to give that all up and just go there as a holiday maker because it was my home. It is my home. It is where the rest of my family stay. But one day, just before I work, a voice that I believe was God's voice or Christ's voice or the Holy Spirit said to me, Mark, you will go to Fentestor. From Mossel Bay to Fentestor. I was confronted with things that I did not want to be confronted by. But yet, I packed my bags. I put my computer into a big case, a plastic bin, Loaded it onto a plane and flew to Johannesburg. Then got a bus through to Poch and I was picked up in Poch and taken to Fender's door where Tanya was. Tanya had visited me previously in Mossel Bay and I was also missing her. So it wasn't too hard to make that move. But the fact is I had to give up Mossel Bay and I didn't want to because I did not see God's overall plan. And even though before that I had these nagging feelings that I must come up this way, I kept on trying to find a solution so that I could take Tanya to Mossel Bay and that I could continue the life that I had there. But that was not God's will. God sent me to Fender's door. By whatever desires or means he had, he sent me there. And when I was there, I was confronted with many challenges. Challenges that I did not want to experience. And I did not know what God's will was. And I started a small congregation, Anglican congregation in Fenderstool. I still did not know what, what God's will was. I heard about St. Mary's and there was no ways that as a lay person I was going to come into St. Mary's. And I was obedient and I did what was required of me to do by God, not because I could see the greater picture, but because I was acting in faith. And through the prayers of this congregation, of this parish, of this flock, God opened a way for to you to receive what you asked for. He took me from Muscle Bay and brought me here. I had to act in faith and now I'm standing before you and I'm testifying that even though we are confronted by things that we do not understand in the periphery of our existence with Christ, because we cannot understand God, we can, don't know His will, we act in faith, and so God has the opportunity to work and to build and to nurture where He desires us to be according to His glory in His kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, be with us this day. Hold us and protect us for the remainder of the week. Nurture us, Father, and feed us, for we are children. We are small and minute. 
and we are of no consequence. But yet, Father, to us our lives are of consequence, and to you our lives are of consequence. Help us to live free of temptation, and to be obedient to you, and act in faith. According to your will, I pray this, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.